to a well-designed business. My name is Luann Nigara, and I'm so glad you found this podcast. Together with my husband, Vince, and our partner, Bill, we have grown our company, Window Works, from the ground up. So I know and I understand the challenges you face in running your interior design business. I also know that your talent alone isn't enough to ensure your success. So on this podcast, we talk about strategies and practical steps to help you grow your business. But make no mistake about it, we have our share of fun here too, mixed in with those aha moments that I love so much. This isn't fluff. Nobody has time for that. Whether you are a new interior designer or a seasoned designer, I am here to help you create and to manage the kind of interior design firm that you dream of. It's straight talk and it's action. Are you ready? Let's get started. Hi, welcome to another episode of A Well-Designed Business. Steve and Jill McKenzie are with me on the show today. And if you are from the Atlanta, Georgia area in the U.S., you probably already know them or you know of them. But if you don't, you're in for a treat. This husband and wife team are a delight to spend time with. And in talking with them, it's so clear the respect that they have for each other and that they each bring something valuable and unique to their business partnership. An artist at heart, Steve McKenzie found his creative niche in the interior design community as the principal interior designer of McKenzie Design. And along with Jill, they own and operate Steve McKenzie's, a home decor business right in the heart of Atlanta's West Side Design District. This followed Steve's 20 plus year career with Larson Jewel, the Berkshire Hathaway owned custom frame manufacturer and distributor, where he served most recently as the company's president and CEO. In fact, you'll hear us talk about Daniel Boschman, who, if you remember, is the owner of Chelsea Frames in New York City, and I spoke with Daniel on episode 191. In that episode, both Daniel and myself and Paul Thomas, an artist from New York City, talked about how helpful and smart it is for you as a designer to develop relationships with artists and framers so you can specify and guide your clients in their art purchases. Now, since opening in 2012, Steve McKenzie's has become a destination for both interior designers and design lovers because they have a curated collection of home accessories, furnishings, and they also have a line of textiles designed by Steve based on his paintings. In the show, you'll hear Steve explain how and why they developed this line of fabrics, and you'll also learn how critical it is to have someone like Jill out there rainmaking to get your product line in front of the interior design community. Steve designs and Jill connects, and she networks and she pitches, and together they create a business they love. Both Steve and Jill credit his corporate experience and his marketing background as a big driver in their success. It takes a village to run a profitable business. And if you have a partner in it with you side by side, who has a different skill set from your own, well, that's like hitting the jackpot. I'm sure you are going to enjoy meeting Jill and Steve. And I just want to say, even if you are a solo designer, you have a business partner too. That's right. My Doma Studio can be that partner that you need, helping you organize your projects, keep track of client and vendor communications, and don't forget the universal product clipper tool that have. You don't even have to change browsers to add products to your catalog. My Doma has you covered. The product clipper tool is right in your bookmark bar and it allows you to clip products and all the important information directly from a web page. Not only is the product added to your catalog, but you also can add it directly into a project. Now, My Doma Studio isn't about to go out and pitch clients for you the way Jill does for their business, but it can do a heck of a lot of things to help you streamline your processes so you can spend more time designing. Go to mydomastudio.com slash a well-designed business for your offer as a podcast listener. That's mydomastudio.com slash a well-designed business. Okay, let's get to the show. Hi, Steve. Hi, Jill. Thanks so much for joining me on A Well-Designed Business today. Hi, Luann. It's great to be here today. 
Hi, Luann. Thanks for having us. Yes. So first of all, I just want to say I think it's so fun because we have so many friends in common. Amy Flurry is a common friend of ours. Laura Thurman from Thurman Design, Jason Oliver Nixon and John Lucky. And then we found an obscure relationship that surprised us. See, all of those designers and people are from the South. And so we weren't so surprised about that. But then we found out that we both knew Daniel Boschman. So that was kind of funny right? <laughs> it is funny. Um, it's funny how lives so overlap in this crazy little design world. Exactly. And basically, if anybody remembers, all of these people have been on my show, but Daniel Boschman was on the show and he is the owner of Chelsea Frames here in New York City. And so in Steve's background, you heard in the introduction that he comes from Larson Jewel. And I said to Steve off air, Huh, do you know Daniel Boschman? And he and what do you tell us what you said? <laughs> well, Daniel Boschman is not only a business associate, but he's like a brother to me. Mm. We are so close. Um, it, we talk all the time, so it just kind of shocked me that we had him in common. <laughs> That's so funny. So here's the thing. Again, as I said in the introduction, there are so many aspects of this conversation that I could go down. You guys, first of all, we've been doing this little series off and on over the uh, first quarter of 2018 on husband and wife teams. Um, Actually, we started it in the third quarter, fourth quarter of 2017. But I've had a lot of requests from designers out there that are either with their husband or wife in business and they both have an interior design firm or they have a design build firm or they have like you guys do a retail and a design and so there was a request for that so you guys feel that need to have a little conversation about that but then you also do have the retail store Steve McKenzie's which is located in Atlanta and then of course Steve does interior design and that is under the umbrella of McKenzie design and then finally you also are doing a lot of creating and product design and licensing of product. So it's sort of like the chicken or the egg, Steve. Where should we start? What are you thinking? (laughs) Well, you can tell we're a little schizophrenic. Um, I'm the creative there that always thinks of a new thing we should be doing. And Jill graciously comes along on the journey. Um, But I would say that it all begins with my art. Um, and my corporate background. And what we're doing today is a marriage of, I've been a painter for 30 years, and a lot of the licensing and product design is based on that. And then the interior design came out of opening the store. So I really think it all comes out of the art initially, but it's really the fabric collection was the genesis of the store and the design business. Okay, so talk. It's funny because I was just going to say, all right, I get that. So the art springs the fabric collection because you're creating designs and patterns, and it's like, hey, let's put it on fabric. But what did you mean there that the store, you just said the store came from the fabric collection? Is that what you just said? It really did. It really did. I knew I wanted to do a fabric collection, and I had all these archives of my art, and um, I can't take credit for doing the digital work. I work with someone that does my digital work. I think we all have to know what we're good at. But she took my brush strokes and put it into patterns for the fabric, and then we kind of looked at each other and said, well, we need somewhere to sell this fabric. And that was the birth of the store, as well as we reached out to showrooms around the United States. So the fabric collection really kind of was the genesis of this whole crazy thing we've got ourselves into. Okay, so that's interesting. So the fabric collection starts it from your art. And is it just, there's a lot of things that could be done with art, not for nothing, but I'm thinking instead of opening a store to sell fabric made from your art, couldn't you have opened up a store to sell your art? Like, why did you? <laughs> yeah, not my idea, but you know, sometimes <laughs> the obvious is just isn't there, is it, Jill? Well, it isn't, and quite frankly, we didn't see anything that looked like us when we opened up. We wanted to convey the warmth and the hospitality and the the uh, environment that that people have have uh, embraced at our frankly our house and that's really kind of what the store looks like okay our house. okay and and we you know end up building community that way too that's been another 
terrific offshoot of of having the the retail space. Well, I have to say, um, I hardly know you guys, right? We met very quickly at Atlanta when I was there at Amer at um yeah at America's Mart for the uh, panel discussion, but. What it is, is it's more what I know of you. So any person that I have spoken to that has ever spoken of either of you always it's it's never oh yeah i know them it's oh my goodness they are so amazing they are so wonderful you're going to love them they are so i have to say that you're describing how your showroom reflects your home and you create a community and created welcome i'm not surprised to hear it and um i think that you are you know you're walking the you know talking and walking the walk you know what i mean because that's what I, the, your reputation precedes you i guess is really what i'm trying in a long way to say <laughs> that's very- very generous of you. Yeah. Thanks. No, 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 but it's true. And so, okay, so so the thing is, though, so now, all right, let's talk about the fabric for a minute. So you have this idea, you have this desire to turn your creations into fabric, and I know that I have talked to a lot of interior designers that have these same yearnings, these same visions, whether it be for fabric or it be for lighting or it be for furniture design. And it's sort of a lot of times like, where do I start with that? So you have this fabric in your mind. Steve, what I know I've talked to Candace Olson and Barclay Butera and others that have designed fabric in conjunction with Kravit Inc. That's a whole different thing because that is owned by Kravit, you're talking about making your own fabric line, now selling it yourself, but then also selling it in different showrooms across the country. What what made you go one way or another, or did you explore both and decide on this? How did that happen? Uh, very good question. I um, knew I wanted to have a fabric collection, and at the time, we were just starting this business. I have a long corporate history of product design. I've done product design in the home sector my entire career. And so I had a little bit of knowledge about product design, but I certainly didn't have knowledge of textile design specifically. And this is where that beautiful network of this lovely industry comes into play. I have a dear friend, well, friends, plural, the Habel sisters, Susan and Kate Habel, Cable Construction is their line, and they had had their textile collection for 20 years. And I actually used them to help launch my business in textiles. And at the time, we didn't have a brand that a Kravit or Lee Jofa or Schumacher or any of the brands would be interested in. So I knew we needed to go the route of our own collection. Mm. There's pros and cons to both. It's very easy to have the machine of one of these major textile companies like a Kravit to help market and help get the designs done and help get the product made. Um, And you make a royalty off of that. Going the route we went, the benefit is you make much bigger margins because you're taking the profit of the sale, but it's a much harder road to, to go down because you really have to finance it. You have to find people to sell it, et cetera. So, I mean, it's really, you have to weigh the options, but given where we were at the time and not really having a national brand behind us, I knew that if I wanted a textile collection, we had to go the route of marketing and manufacturing ourselves. Okay. And so the thing about launching your own textile line or any product line for that matter, it's more than you mentioned that you have to finance it yourself to get it up and off the ground. And you have to then worry about and figure out the distribution and sell it yourself. But there's like step before that. There's the step before that is where do I have it made and how do I get it made? And do I get it made in the U S and do I get it made, you know, overseas and who, you know, is there a yellow pages for, okay, you want to have a fabric line? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's a very good question. And in fact, I turned to the Hables and I actually paid them a consulting fee right. to get us launched. And that introduced me to the manufacturing options, how to get it digitized, et cetera. And they helped me get the brand launched. I turned to experts that have been doing it for 
for 20 years. Okay, smart. And it's interesting because I thought you were going to say to me, based on your previous career that you said, like in corporate, that was involved in product design, that you knew the, the players. But even still, like you said, that wasn't fabric design. But So I think what I'm hearing is your experience in – creating or part of the corporate position with launching and creating and designing product, you knew enough to know what you didn't know. And so you knew enough to go to somebody that was doing it and just pay for their expertise in assisting you with getting all the players and the, and the, the ducks in a row, it sounds like. That's absolutely right. And you know, I've heard these wild stories about someone having an idea and spending endless hours on Alibaba looking for a Chinese factory to make make XYZ for them. And those don't usually end well. So I truly believe if someone's an expert out there, there's some way to engage them to help launch what it is you have a vision for. And I'm going to ask a question um, that's kind of direct, but we'll see how you feel about it. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So the question is, is the person that you went to, Susan and Kate, and of course you said you paid them, but that wasn't their business assisting other people in launching and figuring out how to launch their fabric line. So it sounds like to me that there was a little goodwill involved there because like, for instance, somebody listening might be like, awesome idea. I'm going to contact Steve and (laughs) ask Steve if I can pay him to help me. And the thing is, whether you're interested or not, or whether the fee is reasonable or not for you to do it, you're also running your own business. So What's the rub there? Is it just that you actually had enough of a friendship that on top of that with the fee that they were willing to like, or could they just chunk and batch the time and say, okay, Steve, yes, Steve. And you know, Jill, if we sit down, it'll take us five hours. I can put you on the road because I'm even still someone who, like you said, just trying to find the distribution and the manufacturing on their own through China or whatever, still asking somebody who's an expert that that's not their business is a big ask. No. I think it is. Um, We definitely had a long relationship, which helped. But I think that also let them know that I wasn't going to be too needy. Mm. And I was very respectful of their time. We would outline what we were going to cover in a face-to-face meeting or a call. And, you know, I think we both respected each other's boundaries on that. Mm -hmm. And and they made some reasonable money for their time, and I got what I needed to launch the product. So I think you, you're correct. You have to be careful in expectations when you go into that. But I think that's just business in general. The clearer you can be about expectations and mutual understanding of what something's going to be, the better the outcome for both parties. Right. And it's funny because we recently have done a couple of shows where the um, guests have described mentor and mentee relationships with Cheryl Luckett we had and uh, Rashida Gray and even Laura Thurman. And the thing about it is, is that has always been expressed as the key in those which are not paid relationships, but the same thing to what you just said. You made sure that each meeting had clear parameters and that you didn't overstep and you showed and you both respected each other's time and what you were asking for. So, and of course, this was a much bigger endeavor so the there was a pay for the the expertise so i like it okay so but now i have to ask the question the person listening the designer listening that has got these amazing designs in their head now too and they wondering what to do short of having a friend in the industry where would you suggest somebody go for something like this i mean you don't just knock on kravitz door and that's a different sort of relationship we've already established um I, I, what would he, any ideas? What would you say to somebody listening? I think um, networking. There is a lot. There are a lot of boutique textile collections out there right now. There's really it's a burgeoning kind of maker's market, and certainly networking and getting to know others. I know here in Atlanta alone, I can name ten textile designers off the top of my head that are in showrooms around the United States. And I think getting to know folks um, and networking, but then there's a lot, you know, the internet has so much information 
And you just have to diligently sit down and really research textile design, who, who are the players out there, who are the printers out there, what are the different kinds of printing, educate yourself. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of people that have ideas about products they would like to do or um, things that they could bring to bear on a product. But, you know, it takes a lot of hard work mm -hmm. and frankly, it takes money and so I would encourage people to really be diligent about researching what's out there um, before they get into it. You know, I, I'm happy. I'm contacted regularly by young designers that think they want a textile collection. I'm happy to do the five minute conversation with them. Mm -hmm. I feel like people have done that for me, but the rest, you've got to do research. Mm -hmm. Jill, do you have anything to add to that? I was going to say once it's, and you, my advice would be once you have it, if you want to go down there, you've got to hustle to get it out there. Right. It, it, people aren't going to come knocking at your door. You've got to be willing to, you know, put on your big girl panties and get out there <laughs> and, and knock on doors. And, you know, for us, we learned a whole new industry for me, especially, um, and, and have made terrific relationships and friendships, but it's a whole new world. So the research behind the players, what Steve was saying about networking and, you know, even offering to do uh, a shadowing. Can I, can I shadow someone in your office for a couple of days at, at, you know, you don't have to pay me and I'll be quiet, but let me, can I see what this looks like on, on the flip side, mm -hmm. I think would be worthy. And, and there's a, a huge point in there because it's so typical for the personality that is the creator that has these passions and these ideas and, and has this vision of whatever the product line is, is to... It's just it's just typical for that same personality to not have the skill set to put it out on the street. And Correct. yes, and so that is you two are very fortunate because that happens to be your skill set, your your background in retail, and you're growing up with the entrepreneurial family and all of these other things. And it sounds like to me, and even Steve said it from the beginning, he comes up with the ideas, and you know you basically <laughs> help make them happen. So if you don't have that other half of you, whether it's a partner in life or just business or a mentor, it, you can't, like you said, you can't just create it and think that, oh, you know, the doors are going to open and people are going to sell this stuff. You have to then be a super crack salesperson to get it into these showrooms, I would imagine. You do. Uh, and you need to know where, you know, think about where do you want them to be? Is this a good fit? Is mm -hmm. this the best fit? And pursue those avenues. Right, 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 right. Uh, I really think you hit on something, Luann, and this is the husband-wife team because I will give Jill all the credit for being out there. She calls on individual designers, making sure they've got our memos in the library. She's looking for places for us to have distribution, and it takes that hustle, and mm -hmm. it's hard to do it if you're just one creative. And that's a good point. You know, you guys are in business, in, you know, many, many years at this point. And to just think about that, that you just expressed that there's Jill sitting at the desk at the showroom and she's calling designers to remind and make sure they have your products in front of them in their studio. You know, I'm sure there are people that would come into your, your retail showroom, meet you guys at a networking event and think, ah, easy street, phone ringing, everybody's orders flying in, no big deal. <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Lots of hard work. <laughs> it's it's a hustle all the time, right? It's a hustle it all is. the time. It is. Yeah, it is. And the funny thing is, is I don't know which one of you is the one that's always like, you know, I call my husband almost, he's, I, I love him to death. And thank God, because he is the one that keeps our ship running straight. He's our Jill. He's the one, I'm the one with the crazy ideas. And he's the one that's like, all right, <laughs> how are we going to make that one work? And where are you getting the money? to make that happen and blah, what's the ROI on that, right? But right. he also has this personality and I'm curious if you share it, Jill, is like we just come off of January 2018. Window Works is in business 35 years. Now we know, thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. We know this is not a surprise that the first quarter of the year is a tough quarter. This is, you know, we have 35 years of records. We sit there every single Monday in a sales meeting and we look at every single month's gross sales for the, that the year we're in 
and the pre- th- previous three years. Now, on the computer, we, Kimberly points, prints that out for us. But on the computer, we can make a click and see every single month for every single year for 35 years, right? But it's so funny. It's like it's a shock to them every time. We don't have a, a profitable <laughs> January. Well, we didn't make or break even number in January. And I'm like, look at it. And I'm like, no crap. We never do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, know. but knowledge of doing that and still paying the bills are two totally well, different things. And he just looks at me and he goes, well, what are we going to do in February? I'm like, we're probably not going to break even in February either. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, you know, we're probably not going to break even until March. I don't know what to tell you, buddy. But, <laughs> but it's like, and the thing is, and so in the moment, depending on the moment, sometimes I make fun of them. Sometimes I take them very seriously. You know what I mean? But the reality is, is that I am always grateful for him because he never lets us forget the hustle. He never, and that's, see, I love the hustle. I, I love to do it. You just have to, you know, tell me, oh, go hustle. Okay, let's go hustle. But it comes from, because I love the process of the hustle. It, it you know, his comes from, we have to pay the bills. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> So you do need that. I have met a lot of uh, business owners that don't have that other half, that have that uh, that partner or that husband or that wife or just the, the actual, just a business partner that's not related to them. And it, I find that the most successful businesses, small businesses like ours are, um, that there are the two sides, the person that just dreams and the other person that says, okay, a little reality would be really swell about now. <laughs> so, well, you know, that's good. where we're really fortunate because with Steve's corporate background, we're always very, very grounded. Yes. Yes, he can dream, but he's, mm-hmm. believe you me, he is bottom line. Oh, I can so, imagine. I can that's, imagine. Yes. That's, it's a good pairing. Yeah, it sounds like it really is an excellent situation for you too. So, so now talk to me about opening this showroom. So now you are with your fabric line. You're like, okay, we need a place to sell it. In addition to other showrooms, you decide to open your own showroom, and that is also an interesting choice to me because just hustling it out into other showrooms is a full-time endeavor in order to like you said Jill you have to you can't just knock on every showroom's door you have to it's like it's like what Amy says about when you want to pitch to be in press right she says Mm -hmm. know the magazine know their aesthetic she says follow that magazine you can't if you're going to do mid-century and this magazine is doing shabby chic every issue like don't call that editor right 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 so It's the same as what you're saying is you had to first evaluate which showrooms had an aesthetic that would that your fabric line would fit in. But my question is, why did you, on top of that challenge, also put the challenge on your plate of actually opening your own retail store, which is a, it's, a, it's another entity altogether? Keep in mind that in the beginning, um, we did not have the interior design business. It came out of the showroom. Oh. Um, and... I saw foolishly that there was this big movement for Southern designers in fashion, specifically Sid Mashburn and Billy Reed. And I was watching what was going on and they had distinctive voices about what their Southern influence had done to their design that were unique. And I felt we could do the same thing in um, the home interior sector. And so the, the fabrics were part of a lifestyle we wanted to present for a brand. And I was very brand driven given my marketing background. And to me, for people to experience the brand and understand it in the beginning, the showroom was the, really the only alternative. Um, I don't recommend that an interior designer think about opening a showroom. Mm-hmm. It is a big responsibility. It consumes a lot of cash and you have to be there all the time. And so, but for me at the point and juncture we were in launching this brand, it seemed like the logical extension to create this brand vis-a-vis a showroom and a lifestyle store. I remember right when we were doing it, I was at High Point and I was talking to Bunny Williams and told her what we were doing. And she goes, you've lost your mind. Why are you doing that? <laughs> You know what? She was right. <laughs> you lost your mind. I love it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's yes. funny. I could just picture her saying it too. What? <laughs> you lost your mind. 
<laughs> yeah. Next um, time I see her, I want to remind her she's done it also. Since that's then. right. That's right. Right. Exactly. Oh, not a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> So, but I'm hearing what you're saying though in there is that again, and I, and, and Jill, to your point, it's coming from his background and what he did, right? He was, what you, it sounds like you're saying to me, Steve, is that, okay, one thing I trust my wife. I know she's an excellent salesperson and a business person. She's going to go out and put this into a bunch of showrooms across the country, but you wanted to personify your brand. You wanted to make it an entity and present it in a way that you wanted not just the rack on the back corner that had Steve McKenzie on the top of it in XYZ showroom. You wanted to really create a, 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 basically a personality around this fabric. That is exactly correct. And that idea of that personality, and it was everything Jill described earlier, the graciousness, the warmth, the hospitality, um, we have procured a ton of press because of it. So Mm -hmm. from that standpoint, it was really wise because people could understand the brand that way. Mm. That's nice. And then Jill, what you did was I understand your particular superpower in addition to running the back end of the business of the uh, retail showroom is the, as much as Steve is an interior designer and he does the interior design for the, for the clients, I understand the showroom design is really and much, very much in part you're doing. Is that, am I correct in that? Um, mostly, mostly. Well, believe you me, um, uh, as we all know and love Steve, he, he always has a, a good opinion about <laughs> arrangements and, and, and truly the best eye, honestly. So, okay. um, I was always we, wait, waiting for a backhand there, Steve, but no, then she ended it up <laughs> with, it <laughs> no, 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 no. So it's, um, it, it, it's both of us really to, to arrange and rearrange and to, to keep it fresh. Mm, but I, I think, think a lot of the product assortment in our showroom, Jill generates. Okay. And um, I thought I read that you were the one that always created the environments in your home and that the the showroom is the extension of just do- designing and redesigning your homes over the years. That's correct. Okay. So that's what I thought I saw. So yeah, yeah she's just being modest over there, isn't she? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, all right. So then, so did it, it, it did work out the way you envisioned the two of you, that you had this idea, idea of a brand and an experience and a community and between the two of you and each of what you bring to the table, this is what happened. And so did, did it make it easier, Jill, was the showroom of of yours, the two of yours created and in place before you started to call on other showrooms? And if it was, did that make it easier to say, look, this is the brand or were they happening simultaneously and, you know, yada, yada? I th- the store happened first and then it became obvious that I needed to uh, go find the designers and talk to them because they weren't um, breaking down the door. So, <laughs> Um, so I did. Okay. And that's, and, and it was great to be able to invite them over, come mm-hmm. over. We'll, we make a good espresso, <laughs> stop in, see what we're about. And that, that's worked very well. And so, and, but what I was wondering was, was having the success of your retail showroom was some buzz and some goodwill and some energy of that. Did it have to do when you would say, call on, um, you know, I don't know, Kaderis and say, you know, Hey, would you love to have our fabric line in your showroom? Did, were you, were you, did it help in having that success or they were two separate things like a Kaderis or whoever houses your, your product line, your, your fat is going to make their decision based on things that have nothing to do with what they would see happening at your retail store. No, you're right with the first one. It really did help because of the, of the press of the buzz of the, of the, Hey, I have heard of you. Oh yeah, I've been meaning to. Okay, good. And they know that we don't sit on our hands. So I think that shows our character and energy level with what we put into the store and what they've heard about Mm-hmm. If if they haven't visited. Right. Okay. Okay. I love it. Okay. And so then what happens now is 
you have this showroom, you are putting your fabrics in, and then you're inviting the designers. And is it like, well, by the time we drag them all the way down here, the only thing we're selling them is fabric. Let's start putting other products and different accessories and things in it. Or from the beginning, you did that in order to create that homey environment and create that, that replicate the, the feeling that you had been doing in your home all those years. I think from the beginning, we really wanted multi-product categories. We said we would not put anything into the showroom that was not representative of our life and we wouldn't put in our own home. And we still stick to that today. Mm. Um, but that's why we're in tabletop and that's why we're in jewelry is it's a lifestyle. And we knew from the beginning, we wanted it to be a lifestyle brand and a lifestyle showroom experience. So we approached it that way from the beginning. And it's funny, Kaderis is a great example Um, we did business with them as a showroom. They represent people. And then when they were opening in these new design centers to interior designers, they approached us with the fabric line. So they beget each other, you know, the lines start crossing over because of the brand. Okay. And then what happens is now you've got this lifestyle showroom and this is how the interior design is born out of this because people are in, they're admiring the product lines are admiring the way things are assembled and they're saying could you decorate my house could you design my living room and off you go into that now that's exactly what happened and it (laughs) happened right away Mm -hmm. um people started asking do you do design do you do design and um jill's like yes he does go go ahead yes yes, and it's you know thousand dollars an hour and go put the bill out there (laughs) exactly right when would you like him to come over exactly Exactly. i have his calendar right in front of me honey (laughs) and she's reminded me right now i have an appointment right after this with a new client (laughs) look sharp steve (laughs) (laughs) okay so it's it's a great thing so it's Look, the one thing that I love is that there are so many wonderful offshoots, possibilities, things that were created. What, Like you said, one thing begets another thing. But at the heart of it, it should not be underestimated. The financial investment in launching a fabric line, the financial investment in opening a retail store, the financial, like we're talking about opening it. We're talking about leasing, remodeling, and gas and electric. Then talk about the financial investment of the inventory. And, you know, how about the trials of, did you, but well, because you have that strong commitment to the aesthetic of if you would not use it in your home, own home, you won't bring it into the showroom did you not have too many missteps with okay we've got 10 of those and they've been here for eight months and nobody wants them is it really (laughs) absolutely and I want to be brutally honest about that I think for an interior designer to consider opening a showroom you've hit the nail on the head it's it's a lot of hustle but it's a lot of money Mm -hmm. and I'm proud to say we have self-financed we were in a position to do that because of the years of corporate Mm. Um, but to be brutally honest, I'm not sure the showroom, if I knew what I know today, the showroom probably would not be part of our equation. Mm. Um, Stand alone, the showroom, I feel like I work for the landlord, not that I make money off the showroom. Mm-hmm. Um, but it opened up all these other doors, and I'm not sure what the future holds for the showroom for us. Um, it was definitely a calling card that worked our business model, but I think it's very important in business that you constantly evaluate the different components you have and pursue those that are making you the most money. And in our case, it's the interior design and the product design. And then really evaluate is a showroom. Cause I think a lot of people think, Oh, it'd be fun. And <laughs> I could buy bigger. And you know what? There's products out there that we've had on the floor since day one, five years ago. Yes. And <laughs> you, yeah. We keep making them and look that's pretty. Money. But that's money sitting there on the sh- on the floor. Totally is. Yeah, I see totally piles is. of cash in some of those sofas. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, it's true. And it, it and the thing about it is, is it almost sounds like the showroom functioned on a really bizarre level as the way we often talk on the show for a designer's website to function. Right. So it all starts at your website. Have a beautiful website. Your blog is there. That attracts people. 
people in. You're, you ha- you're working on developing an email list and you develop a newsletter that goes out and that brings people back to the website. Your portfolio is there. That attracts people in. It's almost like the most insanely expensive website ever. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yes. That is it. Exactly. There are so many other things you can do to market yourself as an interior designer than to open a showroom. Exactly. <laughs> Especially a 4,200 square foot showroom. Oh, right. my goodness. My goodness. Right. right. And the thing is to keep keeping in mind that this was, you know, as you said, this comes from many years experience of being in corporate and marketing and understanding those things and also having the benefit of having that corporate position to have some cash in order to do this. So if you're 30, 35 years old and you've only, you know, have 10 grand in the bank, this isn't going to happen. This is not realistic. It right? shouldn't that, happen. No. no. <laughs> it should not. And do not do it with debt. Right. That is just the most foolish thing you could do. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it's a different mindset. It's a different mentality. Again, we said it earlier in the show that even to be the creator and the designer of a fabric is a d- completely different skill set for marketing that fabric and being the one to market it. But even being a creator and a designer of a showroom and to put it all together and make it look lovely is completely different than the person, like I'm sh- assuming it's Jill, that has to be cutthroat and say, you know what, this line doesn't work in here. I don't don't care how much we love it and we would have 20 of them in our house it's not selling we're not ordering it again right like you have to Correct. be right okay okay that, that happens all the time doesn't it sweetheart it, it, it does. <laughs> i love it how come they don't love it <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. people say they love my taste why aren't they buying this <laughs> See, you can't take it personally. You put it into a personal yeah. thing because we forget that it feels personal, but that's just it, right, Jill? Correct. It's exactly it. it if it's not working, you've got to be ruthless about it and and move on. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Make a decision and move on. Very good. Very good. So tell me, talk to me a little bit about some of your observations about working husband and wife together. I, I hear that you seem, you know, it sounds like you absolutely have a great respect for each other's skill set. But, you know, look, I have a great respect for my husband's skill set. And it's not all happy and hunky-dory all the time either. So, you know, like, I mean, there are, we have mechanisms for when we're going to disagree. Talk to me about what happens in you, in your dynamic business wise when one of you feels strongly about something or are you just completely so delineated and have the different hats that you just are like okay it's her job she says it and i have to do this what what tell me about the the relationship there well it is certainly not the latter <laughs> <laughs> um, hmm. we, 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 uh, we both have strong opinions about what the other one's doing. I think it's how you sort that out um, is really the answer. And I think it just intuitively, we both respect each other immensely. And Jill likes to say, and I think it's absolutely the case, it took 34 years of marriage before we ever could have become business partners. Oh, nice. And so you really know the person really well. Um, and there are natural areas where I know she's the expert. Mm. Um, and you acquiesce to that because you know that they're right. Um we are able to have a dialogue generally pretty well. And then when I don't disagree, I just give her the silent treatment. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. And how about you, Joe? What, what do you say to, because we have had the requests from younger couples that are, are starting out in business with each other and saying we're hungry for tips and ideas and suggestions on making both the business and the relationship solid. That's a very good point. And it's very good to be aware of that too. And we could probably use some tips from you, Luann, about um, Mm -hmm. navigating at home. When, you know, when is it, when, when do you, is there a cutoff time Mm -hmm. for business work? What time in the morning can we start talking about business? Um, when are we not talking about the business? Um, so that's that's all things to to think about. Um, I, I, and we a good example is we just had our son's wedding, which was wonderful, and we made the decision to congratulations. To by the way, thank you, thank, thank you. you very much, and just said, look, this is very important family time, and we're we're absolutely going to shut down for X amount of 
hours and everybody was fine. Mm. Um, no, no interior design crises happened. Right. So, and it was only hours. I thought you were going to say days. <laughs> it was a, a certain amount of hours for three days. Okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, but we put it out on all social media and just said, listen, I hope you can support this. Right. I mean, you know, but this is what we've got to do. I think Jill brings up a really good point in that we we are such hustlers that we really live this business probably way too much. Mm -hmm. And we do need to set parameters at home. And I would encourage couples to do that if they're starting out when you can and can't talk about the business. What is nice, either one of us can say to the other, you know, I just really don't want to talk about Mm -hmm. that right now. And we respect it. Um, But it's easy to make it all consuming. Mm -hmm. Yes, I have found that, and it sounds like you might be the similar, but I have found that we don't have a rule that says not before this time or not after this time, but we have either a direct response or we read a, an inferred response that says, you know, not really into it right now. So it's that sort of a thing. And there's times when, you know, cause, cause the same way we're passionate about our business and we love doing it and we love doing it together. And there's always that, it sounds the same as for you, the feed of the ideas. One person has one idea and you build on it back and forth. And, but there's times when it's just like, I, I, I just can't talk about this now. <laughs> I need a break. And so, and then it is a matter of the backing off instead of, oh, okay, that's fine. But it's like, no, the I can't means I can't, like I don't want to. <laughs> so exactly. it sounds like that's what you guys do. It's like, you're happy, happy, happy to talk about it unless one of you, you know, pulls the plug and says, can we not do this now? Yeah. Correct. I, I think so. I agree with that. Yeah. And, and that's, you know, it's funny is I guess somebody who's not in business with their partner or their spouse might think, well, that's so obvious, isn't it? <laughs> but I don't think that it is. I think that it is a dance that you learn because when you are young and passionate and involved, whether you're young in years or young in business, it, you could be 50 years old and it could be a new business. So it's a young business and you're into it. Um, the thing about it is, is when you are fired up about something and the other person isn't in the frame of mind to talk about it, 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 you could be a little bit in jeopardy of being a railroad and going, Oh, I know. No, 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 that's okay. I, but I just wanted to say, and it's, you know what I mean? (laughs) Right. Like, you know that. Oh yeah, no. Okay. But (laughs) so, um, there is a a note in there. And so anyway, okay. All right. So I like that. And then the, the covering of the actual showroom and the hours and all that, Jill, do you have staff that does that? Or if it's open, you're there, how does that work? And are you open nights and weekends? What's that look like? Sure. We are, if it's open, one of us is here. Whoa. We have had uh, a terrific, a couple of terrific full-timers who have moved on to other positions. Um, right now we're running it with the two of us and um, two sporadic but super helpful part-timers who will um, come in and, and help us and, and jump right in. We do have a terrific intern right now from the Atlanta Institute of Art which is a, a a great energy booster and and a great help. Hmm. But yes, if it's open, we are here. We are closed Sunday. That was a decision we made early on. Um, we tried nights that quickly shut that one down. So we have figured out our hours. That's a lot. I mean, how do you go on vacation? You don't. <laughs> That's insanity. You don't. Um, it, it, it we yeah we need to look at this picture but yeah, yeah. we're evaluating please <laughs> we're evaluating like your uh-huh. okay we might be tired <laughs> that's crazy and 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 so why is that that one of you is always there is it just simply because you're in between like you said at this point your 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 support staff are part timers that you are not with that or even when you had that full time person were one of you there. We would leave when one of the full timers was here, and we did do vacations, and we did do a, a, some great business trips thanks to having that solid full time person here. Mm. Right now, we're reevaluating exactly what we need in in help. Is it more graphic design? Is it more on the design and website side than physical retail? And and quite frankly, not not a lot of people are jumping up and down to to work retail. Mm-hmm. So 
Is there anywhere in the conversation where after these years of being established with the retail and the brand and all of that, is there any thinking about, huh, do we have to have 4,200 square feet? Could we do what we do in 1,500 square feet and really um, pare this back and not have it be such a beast and therefore we don't need as high a level full-timer in order to oversee it so that we can get some breathing room? Or Have you been listening to our business conversations lately? <laughs> <laughs> that is the dialogue that is of the moment. Okay. Well, if I were coaching you, that's about what I'd be saying. I'd be like, guys. <laughs> you, you know what the future looks like because the interior design business and the product design licensing and Jill selling are the things that mm, are driving it. Manage. Mm-hmm. Get the flexibility we need, mm-hmm. et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. No, I mean, I can see it. Look, I think it is. A, it was a genius way to introduce and splash, but I don't think you need to sustain it for many years. Another, you know, it's like you said, it's all the other arms that are filling it in. <laughs> I'll tell you, the showroom is not for the faint of heart. No. I hope all your listeners hear that. I know. I think we're really pounding that in. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I feel sorry for the person who's just about to open. They're like, are you right. kidding me with this conversation? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I, I grew up retail and I, I mean, I know this, I lived this, um, the working on Saturdays, the doing deliveries with my dad who had a corporate job. So it was my mom and like these three retired ladies who could only work, you know, 19 and a half hours <laughs> a week each. It, I, I don't know how they did it. I really don't. What was but her show and what was her retail? It was a, it was a Scandinavian import That's business right. in right. Indianapolis. And then we actually had three locations at one point, Wicker and then um, Kitchen, a kitchen kiosk. Great brands. It was, you know, looking back, I thought it was a lot of fun. It, it, it was it was a lot. Yeah. It, yeah. You know, yeah. People, <laughs> Well, yeah. it's interesting when you grow up in your your parents' business like that. You do learn a lot, right? Do you, can mm-hmm. you think about some of the things that you, when you're doing your day, Jill, and you're going through your process that you re- recall your mother and, and think, okay, yeah. Oh, I am. I mean, we are using her, um, her their shelving from their stock room in here. Oh. We have, I mean, we have definite uh, hand-me-downs that, that saved, they were saved by, from the store, but I... I understand now. I mean, why they did, you know, shoot, she was imprinting Christmas cards in the basement during (laughs) Christmas. It was, and that's what you did. That's what you did for your customer. (laughs) And I think that's what my takeaway is. And that's what we do too. That's what that's just what we do for our customer. Well, and that's a good good place to go right now because that is one of the other things that comes through when I research the two of you is this commitment to customer service that it's the center of everything you do. Talk a, talk a little bit about that and what it takes to do and what does it mean to the two of you. For for twenty years, I'm going to back up because it was a mentor that gave me such an orientation to the customer. Um, Craig Ponzio was the private owner of Larson Jewel, where I spent the majority of my career, 20 years. I was um, vice president of marketing for 10 and then CEO for 10 after Berkshire Hathaway bought it from him. We had um, some values, and he made sure everyone in the business understood it. So you could go to the janitor and ask him, and he knew it all the way up to the CEO's office. But the very first value was the customer always comes first. Mm. And we live that. I'm so proud of Larson Jewel because we lived that. And if you ask any customer, they would tell you that. Ask Daniel Boschman. Um, but it just is ingrained in our being. And I think Jill is just naturally very gracious and accommodating and empathetic also. And so we don't have to spend a lot of time talking about it, but I don't ever want a customer to leave here frustrated or disappointed. Mm -hmm. And the same is true about my interior design business. We will make it right. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it is our mantra. And I think it's something that it's our superpower, as you call it. Mm -hmm. It's just, we really live it and try to breathe it every single day. It's, it's, it's funny because Window Work shares that with you. And I think sometimes I have talked with other business owners that think they do it too. And you not you do it's not just a line, right? It's no. not just a no. sign on the door. There is 
a deeper meaning and level to it that is because what happens for me you tell me I find that when a company says they are engaging in customer service and that it's important to them where you find out when it's not is if there's something that goes wrong that is the responsibility of the customer like it's clear that the customer made the mistake and the company is all about well you made the mistake you made the mistake you made the mistake <laughs> right that's that a, never pays off <laughs> that's right and the thing is it's if you are really about customer service the conversation is I'm sorry, you're not happy with this. What would have happened to make you happy with this? Not like, how could you have done, you know what I mean? And, no, you, exactly. you, and you know, as the person who took the order, did the order, whatever, that it's on them. But you don't ever, it's almost like you never want your customer to lose face. That's how I Correct. always look at it, right? Is that Correct. how you feel about it as well? That is absolutely how we feel about it. It's just you're never going to win that battle if you want to prove your customer was wrong. Right. It's just it's just inappropriate. And I think these businesses that have to put it on the door or tell people we're great at customer service, something's wrong. You, they just need to experience it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's I'm, I'm I'm searching my brain. There was a situation just recently in an interaction that I had with a company, and I just finally said to them. Could we just do this because I'm a good customer? How about that? How about that? How about you just take all of this other stuff off the table and you recognize that I have been your customer for 30 years and you give me a gimme on this, okay? You know what I mean? Because I, it was like I believed them to be in the wrong. I actually did believe them to be in the wrong, but they kept wanting to come around and say, well, I could have dotted that T and I could have crossed that I and I could have done this and I could have done that. And I just finally went, you know what, stop. Like, how about just evaluate that we've been doing business for 30 years? How about there? You know? <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. That's it, exactly. And I can think of a specific example from a tile company with our own home that we just recently remodeled when we mm -hmm. relocated to a condo. And I had this beautiful marble floor put in the, the kitchen. And three days in, we dropped a bottle of wine, and it etched the oh. marble. I called and said, listen, I did this. Mm -hmm. But they just kept coming back to, well, you know, we're not really responsible yes. for this. <laughs> and I said, I know that. I told you I'm responsible, but we still want to get it fixed. And they just kept arguing in every email over and over and over. Well, you know, this is your fault. And I'm like, eventually, I, I don't do business with them. That's and it right. wasn't because it was like, I get it. I'm wrong, but right. I still need it fixed. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I, it's, I call it the blame game. It's like, what do we need to play the blame game for? And, and when I'm, you know, talking with business owners, it's, you, you, it's great. You get brownie points. You get points in whatever business heaven there is because you know that your customer is wrong right now. Awesome. Now, do you want business points that make you money? Don't point it out to them. <laughs> right. You're exactly right. Exactly. Well I totally you, subscribe to that. If you want a repeat customer and a customer who says good things to their friends about you, right. how am I going to deal with this? Right. That's So you, you make it a win-win. Mm -hmm. And also, I think that's how we're going to differentiate ourselves and compete against online sales. Right. Good point. You know, I'd, I'd like to know how somebody's customer services with, you know, some big behemoth online sale. And I hope I hope I'm much better than that. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's the truth. I mean, you know, you all the time you can go into a big box store, whatever it might be, whatever brand, whatever category of product we're talking about, and you can have a positive experience. And you can do it every day for, you know, every month for 12 months of the year. Walk in, get customer service, get your questions answered, check out, the lady says hi to you, the guy at the door waves you goodbye, and you can have a great experience. And you go online for a big store like that, and you're going to find 50 bad reviews. Because, you know, there is the whole online experience, and because there is so much more that goes into when you are dealing online the things it's so to your point 
when you're dealing with you in person, that's your edge over the online marketplace is that you are in person and you can make that connection and you can have an interaction that maybe isn't always positive, but you can round it up in positive because like what you were experiencing with these, an email, they, oh, it's your fault. It's your wine. It's your bottle. It's like, oh my goodness. <laughs> like, I know all that. Yeah. If they were standing there in person with you, that conversation wouldn't have gone that way. You would have said, I dropped the wine and they would have said, oh, let me try and fix it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. But as soon as it becomes an online interaction, email, whatever, or phone interaction where there's no face to face, it gets tougher to get to that real, hey, I'm a person over here. Hello, that's me. Real person, right? <laughs> I think that's a good business practice in general is a pro- especially in problem solving and resolution with clients get on the phone or do it in person mm-hmm. have the conversation don't be afraid to do that right. because there's just so misunderstanding in our written word whether it's email or text or whatever um, handle it face to face or at least verbally together it's the truth it's that's your your point in there is is deal with it head on and diffuse it and own it right? And, right. and and try and resolve it. Very yep. good. Very good. So you guys have got a lot on your plate down there. You really do. And you seem to be juggling it all with a lot of grace and a lot of, um, you know, just, um, I, I don't know. You're very, you, you have a, I said it in the beginning, you, anybody that I have mentioned or spoken to or mentioned you, it's always with the most esteem. And I, I really do. I'm, I'm glad to actually know you better now. I thank you very much for spending your time with me today too. Oh, it's been our pleasure, Luann. And um, we hear the same about you, <laughs> but you know, this is a wonderful industry we're in and I just find it's very collegial. And if you can be kind to others, there's so many people that want to see you succeed. And I would recommend that to anyone starting out is just really get to know people and open yourself up and be vulnerable. That's going to contribute to your success. I love it. Great advice. Thank you so much. Thank you, Luann. Thank you so much, Luann. We look forward to seeing you soon. Me too. I told you they were pretty terrific, didn't I? All righty. So we have lots of takeaways. Let's start with these. How about transferable skills, right? They both credited Steve's career at Larson Jewel with informing him and the ways they run their business. And I'll tell you what, for more on that sort of discussion, you should head over to episode number six with Erica Ward. And interestingly, Erica Ward is also an Atlanta interior designer, but we discussed transferable skills with Erica as well. Now, how about despite a 20 plus year career, in, which included being a CEO of Larson Jewel, which I'm going to tell you operates 54 facilities in 15 countries around the world. How about despite that, when Steve wanted to go into product design, he reached out for help and advice. He says, look for someone who has done what you want to do and pay for that help. So at every level, no matter how accomplished we may be, if someone knows more than us and can help us cut that learning curve, whether it be through mentorship, coaching, do not hesitate to seek out that help. Okay. And then how about their advice for working with your husband, your wife, your partner? Steve said it pretty well, I thought. He said, success in business with your spouse begins with the respect of the person and as important is the respect for their expertise. I love it. Now, for photos and info on the projects throughout the Southeast and Midwest, which have been featured in Atlanta Home and Lifestyle, and also their showroom, which has been recognized by national publications, including House Beautiful and Traditional Home, follow me on Instagram at LuannNigara.com and on Facebook at A Well-Designed Business. When you follow me on show day, I share photos throughout the day of the design work of my guests, so be sure to check it out and follow me on these locations. All right. Anything else that you need to know that you want to know about a well-designed business or myself, if you want to know how to work with me, if you want to know how to get my new book, The Making of a Well-Designed Business, all of that, including where you can meet me at live events, can be found at www.luannnigara.com. Okay. All righty. Thank you so much for joining me today. Before you go, before you hit stop, 
give it a minute. Think about the one thing that you can do today to make an improvement in your business and then do it. Okay. Decide to be excellent. Thank you so much for joining me again today. This podcast is a production of Window Works, your resource for custom window treatments and awnings. To learn how we can help you on your next interior design project, go to www.windowworks-nj.com. And if you're interested in working with me on your business, either through masterminds or one-on-one coaching, or you want to know how to get my book, The Making of a Well-Designed Business, or you just want to know what's going on in the podcast land, and where I'm going to be. All of that is found at luannnigara.com. Thank you so much. Have an excellent day.